Hi, and welcome to Schmooza Sues. I'm Suze Montgomery, your host, and we've got an interesting show here. Uh, this is somebody I've been really interested in interviewing for a while. I'm fascinated by him and his lifestyle, so let's get right to it. So I've got Tony Alcott here, and Tony, actually, I got to meet at VASE here, where uh, my offices are located, which is Ventura Adult and Continuing Education. I think you were a student here in a class? I was indeed, yes. And you were taking... Spanish. Spanish. Yeah. Did you learn anything? A little more Spanish, yes. A little bit I'm more still Spanish. still not fluent, but I'm getting there. Okay, well, around here it would be a very admirable treat to have, especially since there's so many Spanish speaking. I also took a quick class. A cooking class? I did. What'd you learn how to cook? Thai food, my favorite. Why do you like Thai? Oh, I just love Thai food. I spent time what about in Thailand it? too. Oh, did you? How long? Okay, let's well. start at the very beginning. <laughs> you were born where? Birmingham. Horrible, Birmingham. horrible city. In industrial? A, industrial city in England, the second largest city in England. It's um, very industrial. And, and you it, escaped when? Oh, probably in my early 20s. I went to live in London for a while. And what'd you do? How'd you survive? Um, because you were young, Well, right? I graduated in nuclear physics, believe it or not. Uh, Holy did, mackerel! Uh, my thesis was on nuclear resonance, which became the basis for the MRI machine. That, so, I'm impressed. It's complicated stuff. Why, what attracted you to that field? I don't know, just fascinated experimenting with stuff. You know? And you must have been quite good at it to I be. I was, yeah. Mm. And you did it for how long? Well, I graduated from that and then had nothing more to do with physics after that. Really? <laughs> after you yes, studied? Somehow I, uh, I ended up working for a couple of companies, had my own little company that failed miserably. That was a good experience. Okay. Good then way I went to learn to work something for IBM new. for 17 years. Really? On the technical side, and then I switched to sales and started making money. Interesting change of careers. Yeah. IBM wow. computers, right at the beginning days. Wow, and let's see, I'm trying to remember who did, who was it, IBM, who actually founded the company? I used to know. Thomas that, Watson. That's what it, now did you ever have any contact with him? No. no so, no. so you did, actually, you went into sales, and you, I, I could see you into sales. I was a technical first for several years. So you knew how the mechanics worked. And I, I was uh, actually headed up the, the team that put together their first operating system, believe it or not. Wow. And um, then I, having spent many hours doing that and not earning the money that the salespeople were earning, I thought, i got to go sell this stuff. Well, interesting. But you knew how it worked. So it oh, yes. So that's why you were probably an outstanding salesperson. I didn't think I would be, but it turned out that I, no, was, pretty, I, could see I was that. pretty good. Well, you're very impersonable, so I can understand that, too. Well, okay. thank you. Yeah. And you came to the States? In you, 1965. 1965, 19, ooh, in the midst of turmoil. Yes. A lot of fun in 65. The Watts riots. Yeah, yeah Watts riots, uh, pre-Manson. Oh, yes, yeah. So you really saw a lot of changes. Did you live in Los Angeles? I lived in the Pacific Palisades for a while. Okay, so you were out of the fray. You weren't exactly in Watts no, riots. No, I stayed away from Watts, yes. So you moved, then you were in Palisades. You still continued with... IBM, and then did you make I, another career I, change? Uh, I moved. No, I stayed with IBM for a while. I bought a lovely home in Calabasas, up in okay. the hills, where they said there was always a warm breeze. It turned out to be a hot blast. But very you know, hot, yeah. yeah. But that was nice. It was very nice. And you lived there how long? Well, that's where my, um, I had my children. And uh, your with, children with, are? That was with wife number two. Okay. 
and um, lived there for quite a while. Moved from there to a ranch in Malibu, um, gentleman's ranch, you know, horses, No dogs. farming. No, no, although I did have a ride on lawnmower and a, <laughs> a living housekeeper <laughs> and uh, kids running around and other little creatures, you know, and I was traveling all the time, so. Interesting. So how long were you in Malibu? Until uh, 1977. And you transitioned again. Well, that whole thing fell apart, um, unfortunately, with uh, as divorces, you know, go. Oh, yeah. Right. It's just Swinging door. So I, I think I lost some countless amount of money. I had income property on the beach in Malibu and in Hollywood, and so I was kind of a slum lord, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, having fun and spending money like it was going to last Because forever. it never would stop. And then uh, suddenly it all went down the toilet fast, and the attorneys took their share, and I ended up living on a boat for the first time. Why did you choose a boat instead of like an apartment or a condo or? You know, I was walking by or driving by more accurately uh, one day in Marina del Rey to my office, which was in that area. And I saw these boats. I thought, wow, that's fascinating. So I went to check out the boats and I thought, you know, I could live on one of these things. And um, so I started looking around. And it turns out that Marina del Rey has, I don't know, nine, 10,000 slips. They do. But not many allow liverboards. So I checked all the different people that lease those slips from the county. And there's like 15, 18 of them, lessors. And um, oh, the waiting list was forever. There was no openings, no possibility of uh, getting a, a liverboard slip. And on the very last one on Fiji Way called Fiji Marine, it was a boat dealership and repair place. And they had. The salesman there said, you know, we do have a boat for sale, and if you buy it, we'll give you liverboard privileges. I said, I'll be right down. So I went down and saw the boat. I walked down the dock. Sunny day, you know, sun glinting off the boat. It's gorgeous. <laughs> and I get Angelic. to the boat. He said, this is it. And I, oh, wow, this looks nice. And on the back deck, here was this fellow and his girlfriend at the time, now his wife. Gorgeous blonde. They're drinking champagne. Oh, Hollywood he said, movie Come set. aboard, come aboard. Have a glass of champagne. Uh, he said, let me give you the tour. He gave me the quick tour. I said, I'll take it. <laughs> How big was it? A 36 foot Chris Craft. Oh, Chris Craft. Yeah. Those were beautiful. The wood. Wood boat. Beautiful, yeah. beautiful It's boat. called a lap strake where the wood overlaps. You know, it's, it's a very seaworthy boat. Did you ever take it to oh, sea? Oh, took it everywhere. Interesting. You know, had I known at the time some of the dangers, I probably would never have left the slip. Did you have but any uh, sailing experience? No, no. So ignorance is bliss, you know. So we blazed off the Catalina, and we were all over the place, you know. Interesting. Fortunately, we survived it, so that was good. We didn't have anything. No, we had a compass. That was it. Amazing that Did, you didn't. Oh, it's, it's, it's a miracle we didn't die. And how long were you on this boat? Four years. And you fell in love with living aboard. Are I, you I had a, a great, adjusted? I adjusted, yes. It was a great time. I mean, you make a major adjustment when you move to a boat. So what do you have to do to change your mentality about wrapping your head around having stuff, like we said before, and then having it's, no stuff? It's, it's a major downsizing exercise because if it doesn't fit in your car, it's not going to fit on the boat, which is pretty limiting, especially when you have a ranch with all the stuff that I had. So how did you... So you get rid of everything. You sell it or give it away. And no second thoughts or was there any <sighs> tug of war no, when I'm taking, I'm not There's taking? always some second thoughts, but you know, you, you, life's an adventure. I mean, you don't have a big refrigerator. I'm thinking no. kitchen here, you know. No, no, you have a little thing. Yeah, yeah. So you buy for the day? Well, you adjust, you know, and especially if it's just you. It's amazing how much we were spoiled, you know, with these huge refrigerators and freezers. And, you know, ridiculous. You change your perspective, did you not? Yes, you do. And on a boat, everything has its place. And it has to go back It has to go back where it came from, otherwise it's a mess. So you have to be a bit of a neat freak. Do you think it attracts a certain type of individual yes. or personality-wise? Oh, yes. 
Uh, what type of an individual would really need freaks? <laughs> need freaks? <laughs> people that are consumed by being neat, obsessive, uh, people who types? people who can get away from owning stuff because there's no room for it. And you didn't have a problem adjusting. I wouldn't say I didn't have a problem. It was um, quite an adventure, and it's in my book. You know some of the things that happened. Let's talk about your book here. Beautiful cover. Who did the cover? Uh, I have a publisher in Texas that uh, helped me design the cover and also do a lot of the layout. That's a beautiful book. I mean, Thank there's, you. So there's a lot of great little stories in here. You know, I was paging through. And this It's called Life at the End of a Rope. Great title. Who came up with the title? Interestingly enough, I came up with that title back in the 70s but never did anything with it. I thought one day I'll write a book about life on a boat but never got to it until early last year, and I thought, why didn't I do that? Well, because I'm now back living. Did you have any skills in writing? No. Well, people always said You're I was. somewhat of a renaissance man. People Tom. always said I was, I was a good writer, so I thought, well, we'll see. You speak well. You Thank you. You were obviously educated very well. Yes, indeed. And lucky. so you came away with knowing that, for certainty, that you could write a book. Yes, why not? Why not? It took me about, oh, I don't know, six or seven months on and off. That's all? Yeah, and that was only part-time when I felt like it. Oh. This is amazing to me. People sit there and, you know, I'm trying to think of one author in particular. That I mean, take, uh, let's see, I'm trying to think of Meacham. Do you know Meacham? Yes. Uh, yeah. uh, wrote a wonderful book on Thomas Jefferson that I read. Yes. Yeah. I, I read historical novels. Ah, uh, well, those, those are thick. I mean, this is small. But still, you know, you have to have the same skills to basically be able to write. I think you have to have the subject matter in your mind and some kind of semblance of order of what the story is you're trying to tell. So maybe the way you've organized your life inside of a boat into a space, you do the same organizational development as in writing a book? Kind of. Okay, so I'm trying to tie yeah. this together. To, I'm trying to figure out the way your mind is working here. You know, it started in different pieces, and I had bits of it all over the place. And then I thought, well, why don't I do the first half of the book autobiographically, roughly? So I tell my story of the two, twice I've lived on a boat, once back in the 70s and now for the last three years in, here in Ventura. And then a little bit of advice about what to do about living on a boat how to buy it, where to put it, all the things you have to worry about, well, should worry about in terms of maintenance and all that stuff. So the and boat then, you have now, it's a totally different boat, correct? Totally different boat, yes. Okay. Um, but then the second half of the book, it has nine stories, nine different stories of other people who live on boats. And they agreed to be interviewed. I have, uh, yes, I have the legal agreement to publish. And the photos and the photos of their boats are in the book. And how do they feel about They loved it. I bet they did. I bet you're a good storyteller. Well, you know, it was their story, really. I, yeah. I uh, interviewed them, and then, of course, I you know, edited it and had them prove it and so on. But it went backwards and forwards a few times. I'm but, fascinated yeah. about just in general. I guess it's you know coming from a parent of a pack rat. My mother was a professional pack rat, very professional pack rat. I've told you stories about yes. the ball of... Yeah, foil. The tin foil. <laughs> uh, unbelievable story. The things my mother saved <laughs> when she died, it was just my brothers, like I said, they just put their hands and they went, We're not touching this stuff. That's all yours. And they walked yeah. away. It was heartbreaking and a lot because there were so many pieces of our childhoods in there. Oh, yes. In this garage of 60 plus years. But, uh, you know, and going down memory lane, it was difficult to look at a lot of it too. But a lot of it was just bizarre. I mean, the things people keep. I mean, oh. I'm sure when you were cleaning out, you probably thought to yourself, why do I have this and why did I keep you this? You know, you had to pick everything up and say, D when did I use this last? You so know. did you have a way of purging? I mean, if, is it like the one-year rule that if you haven't used no. it in one year, it gets tossed? I, I, there isn't really so much as a rule as wh you know, whether you A, need it, or B, just can't part with it. Now, I do have a storage unit, but there isn't much in there. I mean, I have some valuable paintings, and a couple of pieces of very nice furniture that I couldn't bear to part with. 
had all my photographs. <laughs> oh, you can't lose those. So, you know. It's, it's your history. Uh, yeah. Basically, you kept The rest history. of it went. It's expendable. Now, you've got a no, new boat, you said, for the past three years. How'd you get to Ventura, first of all? Oh, that's, that's a long story because my life has been a pretty much a, uh, a, a, you know, a kaleidoscopic adventure. You know, it's, uh, it I, sounds, I, I'm fascinated, though. Yeah, uh, I, it was after I published a magazine uh, with ex-wife number four. <coughs> and uh, went, What kind of a magazine? A health magazine, Your Health Connection. YHC magazine published it. It was here in the area. I remember that magazine. It was very popular. It was. But it wasn't profitable. And after 2008, it went. Well, everything did, didn't it? Well, you know, it, uh, when that fell apart, um, a similar thing happened to what happened back in 1977. You know, you lose a lot of money, um, attorneys, this, that, and the other, you know. It's, it's not pretty. So I ended up living in Spain. For Why a bit. did you choose Spain? Oh, I thought I'd, I thought I could settle in Spain and afford it, you know. And I lived there for a few months. Um, decided I wasn't quite ready because my son lives in Venice Beach, so I wanted to be close to my grandkids or closer to them. And uh, I came back and lived with friends for a few weeks and bought this boat, which I now live on. Does the boat have a name? Yes, hiatus four. Hiatus four, referencing meaning time out. Hiatus means time out. Correct. Time out for the fourth time. Fourth I marriage, like it. Fourth, yeah. I like it. Because my first boat was hiatus two by, just by coincidence. And I kept that name. I thought, how appropriate. And how big is this one? It's a little bigger, forty-four foot. That's a big boat. Tip to tail. That's a yeah. that's a big boat. It's nice. It's very spacious. Now, do you sail this one also? No, it's a power boat. Okay, it's a power boat. You went from sail to power boat. No, I had a power boat the first time. The first okay. craft was a power boat. Both 36. Power boats. Both but big power boats. Is this one seaworthy? I mean, obviously oh, yes, it's docked. Oh, yes, very, yes. But, it, but you don't take it out? I do, but right now the engines are being worked on, so within another okay. week or two it'll, it'll be out there, yes. And you'll yeah. take it out? Take it over the islands, yes. But do you dive at all? Did you? I've done a lot of scuba diving. I don't anymore, um, but you know it's it's fun to be out there. These islands out here are, are the Galapagos for America. I mean, they, they are, are beautiful, aren't treasured they? islands. I mean, they are so pristine, and they've done a fabulous job at bringing them back to where they were. They got rid of the pigs. They got rid of. The that eagles. Was, was, well, the pigs were wild pigs. Well, on well, they were Santa Rosa, was it? Uh, mainly on Santa Rosa, yeah, and they had to get them, shoot them all. Not pretty, but, you know, uh, they were ruining the vegetation and the island fox and everything else, and now it's all coming back to a new balance. Interesting. And that's just because the conservancy is yeah, restoring well, the, it? Yeah, the, uh, yes, exactly. Yeah, the Channel Islands Conservancy, and they have um, done a fabulous job. So I want to know a little bit more about living aboard. What would you like to know? So you do laundry where? They have facilities at the dock. I mean, some boats, okay. if you get a large enough boat, you can have your own machines. But I don't have that large a boat. Okay, but so... I'm prepared to dedicate that much space to all. But you can't cook aboard. Oh, yes, yeah. yeah. Okay, and shower. Okay, got a galley. Yeah, full galley, bathroom, shower. TV? Yeah. Oh, of course, yeah. Well, <laughs> I don't know. Yes, okay. absolutely. Yeah. I've never lived aboard. Yeah. Okay, so you have... Most of the convenience is, as a home would. Most, so what do yes. you miss? Uh, is there anything you miss? Uh, my garden. Okay. Don't have a garden. Digging in the dirt. You could mm. do containers. You don't, eh. want, you don't want to mess with plants on a boat. Okay, so that's out. It's just too many things to deal with. You know, you, when you take the boat out, you want to be able to drop the lines and strap things down and go. So there's not a lot of storage, I guess, on this boat. Quite a bit, actually, surprisingly. Yeah. Okay. And you entertain on the boat? I do. Excellent. Happy hours? Frequently. Okay. Yes. And you have neighbors that you like? I do, in fact. Some are coming around this evening. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Bring, they're bringing dinner, which is nice. Wow. Even better yet. Okay. Absolutely. So it, does it become like a little neighborhood family? 
Some, in some ways, yes, but people are very private, you know, and that's good because... It's in, not like a regular housing track then? No, no, because okay. the, the marina in which I live, Ventura West Marina, uh, they have, every other boat is liverboard, 50% liverboards, which means you're not very far away from someone who's also living on a boat. Um, so you need to be respectful uh, you know, with noise and whatever. You, know. you do occasionally get people that you wish were not there, and we've had some of those, and I won't get into that. Okay. Uh, they're now gone, thank goodness. The trailer trash variety. Really? There's a few. But for the most part, people are very nice. Is there a commonality amongst oh, boat yes, liveaboard people? Because boats... Are they like isolationists, or more? Are they more social? They're all over the place. You okay, know, so there's no way you can really pin down you know, a personality are, are, type. Stands for break out into the thousand. You know, you're always putting money into a boat. It needs constant love really? and care. And unless you're a bit of a do-it-yourself person, don't live on a boat. Don't buy a boat. Interesting. Be because well, the same thing could be said about a home, though. No. More so with a boat, because you have on a boat you have. All that you have in the home, plus more engines, and it's all compacted into this small space, most of which is totally inaccessible. So it's very difficult. Plumbing, you have electrical, you have electronics, and all the mechanics of the engines, and it never ends. So you're talking about electrical. You're hooked up to an electrical line yes. for electricity. Oh, now, yes. Okay, so is there like, uh, when you live in this kind of an environment, is there like a fee that you pay? Yes. To what is, is it the it. county? Yes. Well, no, to the, to the marine operator. Okay, so it's a private uh, individual that owns this. Well, they sublease from the, from the county. They sublease these slips as marinas, and then they, as part of the operating expenses, they collect money for the electricity that's used by the tenants. How many are there? How many slips are available? At the West? There are about, in Ventura West Marina, there's about 500 slips of which half 250 are liverboards. That many? And of the 250, they probably average two people per boat. So you're talking 500 people. I'm astounded. I thought it was a very small community, mm -hmm. but it's no. not. No. Interesting. Yeah, it's quite big, yes. I a bunch of characters too, all kind of people. I would love to interview people down there just to yeah. see the general personalities. Well, there's several in the book. Uh, okay. You, know, you have favorites? No, I don't try not to make favorites, but I have some uh, very interesting characters in there. Um, there's a couple that live, it's a very last story, a couple that live on a fishing seiner, 58 foot fishing seiner, and they work the coast from Alaska down to San Diego. Is and this Brian and Dana? Brian and Dana, yes. Young people. And that boat holds 82 tons of fish. Oh, my God. And uh, squid, which is the main catch in Ventura here. I don't know if you know that. 70% of the catch they, is squid. I thought the squid were going away, but they're not. It's been a bad year this year and last okay. year. But in general, squid is the main catch. And it's $650 a ton. You can do the math they're if they make, fill the hold. And they're, that's how they make they their living. They can make 50 grand on one on, on a couple of days going out there and back again. That's amazing. But they could also go out there and catch nothing. The vagaries of... And have all the overhead, and the crew, and the boat. Those fishing boats cost two to four million dollars each. I'm really excited about reading this. A I just haven't made the time. A fishing license for squid costs you over $400,000. A fishing license? Fishing license Is that an squid. annual fee, no, or it's a one time, time only? it's a one time for the captain. Almost a half boat. a mil for a fishing license? Yep, it's going up too. And then you have to have a crab license. And then you have to have a license for other kinds of fish, so it never stops. It's very expensive to be a fisherman. I never knew. I just thought, you'd go out there, drop the line, that's the end of the story. Ventura is the second largest fishing port on the West Coast. Second, that I didn't know second, either. Second to Alaska. Second only to Alaska. Yeah. This is good. I've never known any. This is my backyard. This is stuff I'm not I even aware. Out. 
This is stuff I found out about. You got to get this book, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Please buy the book. <laughs> Please. Fa I, honest, yeah, keeps Tony solvent here so he, so he can buy a bigger boat if he wants to buy, be able to At the other end of the boat. spectrum, there's a fellow in this boat, in the book here, who lives on a canal boat in England. And that's going from one extreme to another. This so is a long boat. These are 70 foot long. Simple I've wife. seen them when I was over there. They're, I was fascinated by that live aboard community. Completely different. Oh, but it's cold in England. Jeez. Yes. No, thanks. How do you heat yourself on well, that? They, they have heaters on them, but rather him than me. Would you recommend doing that for the average person, or it does take somebody that you just have to switch your gears or I something to adjust? I think you have to, to have your mind in the right space. And you were at the time. Yes, but you know, a lot of people who live on boats are sailors. Um, and they do it because they love to sail. And so part of their rationale for living in relatively cramped spaces, because a sailboat has a lot less room than a powerboat, is the fact that they can take up and sail off around the world or wherever they want to go. In fact, the very first story in there is a, a couple and their two children, who at the time, a year ago in March, were 11 and, I want to say 11 and, Thirteen. Oh, was this they, a story in the Star? The Rigneys. They went off and yes. sailed, sailed around yes. the world. Yes. Last I heard, they were in the Galapagos somewhere. God bless them. Yeah. What a what a what trip. a great adventure for kids, right? Yeah. I mean, that's oh, yes. live aboard education. Oh, fantastic education. They'll never have anything like that again. Never. I think we're running out of time. Wow. Oh, boy. Where can we get your book? Uh, it's on my website, oceanairliving.com. Uh, I want to invite you back sometime. I want to continue this. Well, I'm, th I'm having a great time. This is fascinating <laughs> to me because this is a totally different well, way of life that I have for, nothing thank about. You for oh, thank you for inviting me. Thank it's you been for a being pleasure. here. It's yeah. great. And yeah. by the way, you know, you, we didn't really discuss it much, but uh, I'd encourage, like, we started the conversation about Tony taking some classes here at VASE. Yes. We have a multimedia, which is what uh, we're doing right now with our camera crew. These are our students, they're very professional. They're learning how to do this, and I would welcome anybody that come over to VASE if they'd like to learn how to do something in the way of classes or programs. So I'm glad you did, and that's otherwise I wouldn't I, have met you. I think it's a great place to come to learn. So do I. I think, and I'm grateful here that you're here. Well, thank Thanks you. Thanks so for being much. here. You're Pleasure. A, thank you're you. You're a jewel, and thank you for joining us. We'll see you again next week.